Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard, and tonight I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing one of America's most dynamic political leaders, Governor Martin O'Malley. Earlier this year, Martin O'Malley completed his second term as governor of Maryland, ending, at least temporarily, a 27-year career of public service. In 1988, the governor became an assistant state's attorney for the city of Baltimore. In 1990, he was elected to the Baltimore City Council. In 1998, he was elected Baltimore's mayor, and he won Maryland's governorship in 2006. Back in 2002, Esquire magazine named Governor O'Malley best young mayor in the country. Three years later, Time named him one of the top five big city mayors, while Business Week called him one of the five new stars in the Democratic Party. As Maryland governor, Mr. O'Malley signed a bill that made children of undocumented immigrants eligible for in-state college tuition. <laughs> under and he signed legislation legalizing same-sex marriage. Both bills were upheld in voter referendums. A longtime opponent of capital punishment, Governor O'Malley signed a bill repealing the death penalty in Maryland for future offenders. He also chaired the Democratic Governors Association from 2011 to 2013. But let's talk about now. <laughs> the governor is mentioned in the media, discussed in political circles, and has ignited the interest of many Americans as a possible candidate for President of the United States. Yeah. And I'll risk a prediction that he gets a question on that tonight. <laughs> Finally, we hear that the governor is said to be an accomplished singer and guitarist. Speaking for many, I have to say, we're a little disappointed. He doesn't have his guitar with him tonight. Nonetheless, we are entirely pleased and honored to welcome Governor Martin O'Malley to the floor. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Maggie, thank you very, very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you. Uh, the weather's very nice as well. I want to thank you for turning that out a little better than the four feet of snow you endured this year, huh? You deserve a good spring. So. Uh, Look, it's wonderful to be with you, and I want to thank you, Maggie, for your kind introduction and for your hospitality, and also I, I want to thank you for your kind review of my musical abilities. <laughs> uh, I offer the disclaimer that uh, just like in government, I tried to surround myself that, with really good people. And, um, but I've been asked to come here tonight to talk with you, all of you about building an economy that works for everyone and about the better choices that we need to make together if we're going to make that true. Uh, as Maggie alluded to, uh, all through college and law school, I had a band. So I spent uh, log quite a few hours working, and I put that in quotes, uh, but in restaurants and other establishments. And uh, true story, in one of these restaurants, uh, I noticed this man who through his hard work managed to keep the whole business going. He was the guy who was there early. He was there late at the end of the night. He was an immigrant. His name was Miguel. And I remember very late one night, after everybody had gone home, asking him as I watched him sweat and put out a tremendous amount of effort hoisting kegs, bussing, moving things all over the place. I said, Miguel, how is it that you can work so hard? And rather than answering my question, how, he answered me very plainly, why, in just one phrase. And he said, for my daughter. Our national character is defined by a very powerful idea. The idea that the United States of America offers economic opportunity for all. And as Americans, we believe that no matter who you are or where you were born, 
your hard work should pay off. We believe as Americans that every individual willing to work hard should also be able to get ahead. That every American should be able to provide, in other words, for a better quality of life for their children and for their grandchildren. And this is the powerful truth of the American dream that we share. It is the core of our national character. It is the story that has guided our economic choices as a people for most of these 240 years. And these are the choices that built the strongest and most resilient con economy the world has ever known. We, the people, have chosen generation after generation to give our children a future with more opportunity, not less. And together, we've strived in every generation to include more of our citizens more fully in the economic, in the political, and in the social life of our republic. In other words, to extend and to make true the American dream to ever widening circles of our people. This is both the moral theory of our nation and it is the economic theory of our nation. It is this inclusive theory of growth put into practice that has made and built the largest, strongest, and most prosperous middle class that the world had ever known. It is the national story of success that has made us known the world over as the land of opportunity. There is no such thing in our country as a spare American. And I would submit to you that impulse, that impulse that we share as Americans to treat everyone with dignity and respect is the same impulse that is actually best for economic growth of the sort that lifts us all. You see, the economy isn't money. The economy is people. It is the work, the imagination, the grit, the desire, the skill, the love of family, the creative capacity of every person that actually drives our economy and makes our country stronger. This is why signs that once read, no Irish need apply, or no women, or no blacks, or no Jews, have become sad relics of our past. This is why the next generation of Americans so universally rejects state laws that discriminate against gay and lesbian Americans. The fact of our world is this. Democratic nations are more prosperous nations. And it's not merely a coincidence. People in democratic nations have the opportunity to participate more, to innovate more, to take more risks and start companies, and yes, to drive economic demand, consumer demand, through their higher earnings. And this inclusiveness, the robust participation of more and more of our people, is the heart and cause of sustained, long-term generational prosperity in the United States of America. The American economy, the American economy that our parents and grandparents lived and built from their choices was an extraordinary success. I'd like to talk about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. In the economy that our parents and grandparents built, in sharp contrast to what's happened across various income levels over the last 30 or 40 years, in sharp contrast to that, from 1947 to 1979, every income group of households in the United States, from the poorest to the richest, were able to increase their earnings by at least 100% in real inflation-adjusted dollars over that 40-year period of time. All of that progress was built on hard work, expanding economic participation, and policy choices that made sure that wages actually kept up with increased productivity. Of course, all of that started to change when we started making different choices. 
Beginning in 1980, we turned away from this tried and true success story. And we embraced a different theory, a new theory, a new story, a story that turned out to be false. Now, whether we call that story supply-side economics, as President Reagan, its pioneer, liked to call it, or whether we call it voodoo economics, as President George H.W. Bush referred to it, or whether we call it trickle-down economics, as Americans who have come to know it now call it, the primary goal of that theory was this, to greatly concentrate wealth and capital of our nation in the hands of the very few. And what was the promised benefit of this strategy for our country and for our economy, for the common good that we share? It was this, that the very rich, once made very much richer, would invest larger sums of this newly concentrated wealth and capital into greater job creation. And then our entire country would benefit. Just wait, they told us. Concentrated capital and free markets were far better than economic growth, we were told. Far, or, for, were better for economic growth and were far better than wage policies or investment policies or regulatory policies and the actions that used to flow from those common sense policies. In other words, the goal of a stronger middle class was thereby replaced in the 1980s by the goal of capital accumulation and capital concentration. Poverty was no longer a common enemy or a problem that our government could even solve. In fact, the new common enemy became our federal government itself. As President Reagan famously proclaimed, government is the problem. And for the good of our people, we were told, our federal government needed to be reined in, uh, needed to be weakened, needed to be removed from our lives wherever and whenever possible. And over the next 30 years, this trickle-down theory dominated our economic debates and it guided most of our political choices. And its three main tactics were these. Number one, tax cuts and tax policies that not only underinvested in our country and our nation, but grossly and disproportionately benefited corporations and the ultra wealthy. Number two, the systematic deregulation of even the riskiest investment behavior in our financial markets on Wall Street. And three, the adoption of state and national policies that were actually designed through action and inaction to keep wages low in order to make us more competitive. Now this theory, of course, fell totally apart with the crash of 2008. Millions of people lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost retirement benefits, and now Americans all across our country are actually demanding a better balance. As we gather here tonight, wealth and economic power in the United States of America have now been concentrated in the hands of the very few as almost never before in the history of our country. The top 1% of American society now controls more wealth than 95% of American families combined. After worsening cycles of boom, bust, and bailout, just five banks now control half of the $15 trillion in assets of the U.S. banking industry. Corporate consolidations have now created near monopoly concentrations in important sectors of our economy, our once competitive American economy. In the 1980s, CEOs earned 46 times as much as their average worker. And today, the average CEO earns 331 times the amount of their average worker. Bad trade deals have sent American jobs and American profits abroad, and we are all paying for these poor choices. How? We're paying for it in lower wages, and we're paying for it in diminished opportunities for our children. Wages in the United States of America are lower now than they were 12 years ago, and this is the first time that that has happened 
this side of the Second World War, and it is not good for economic growth. Not when 70% of economic output comes from consumer demand. Bonuses alone paid last, last year on Wall Street totaled more than what every American working at minimum wage made in our country. And now concentrated wealth has accumulated concentrated political power in the halls of our Congress and also in many, many, many of our state houses, making it harder than ever to get things done. The vast majority of us, in other words, are working harder, but we're watching our families slipping further behind. And this is not how our economy is supposed to work. This is not how our country is supposed to work. And I know that there are a good many caring CEOs, people like Bertolini at Aetna, Mr. Price, and others who are working on Wall Street, a lot of good people there as well who would agree, and who are troubled, frankly, and they're saddened by what this portends for the future of the country that we love and the future that all of us want our children to have. And it doesn't have to be this way. So how do we change this? And how do we reward productive investment again? How do we restore, in other words, a human purpose to our American economy? I believe that we do this in five primary ways. First, we must restore common sense wage policies that strengthen our middle class. This means that, yes, we must raise the minimum wage and index it to inflation so the minimum wage always stays above the poverty line. We must also raise the threshold for overtime pay, which hasn't been raised since the 1970s, so that people can actually be fairly compensated for the extra work that they're doing on the job, and so that employers will have an incentive to add new workers rather than forcing employees to work longer hours. We must make it easier rather than harder for workers to organize and to press and to collectively bargain for better wages. <laughs> wages that not only keep pace with inflation, but keep pace with the remarkable productivity of American workers. And we must recognize that policies that are good for women and families, like paid leave and safe and affordable childcare, are also good for our national economy and for economic growth because women succeed, our American economy also succeeds. <laughs> and there's another important piece of it, and it is this when it comes to wages. In order to raise wages, we must recognize that immigration reform is an economic imperative for our entire country. We've done this before, and we must do this again. We have to build a path to citizenship, to bring 11 million undocumented immigrants out of the shadows of our economy and into the mainstream, to boost consumer demand, to create new businesses and to expand our tax base, thereby raising wages for everyone. Second, second, we must restore public investments in the common good and the future of our nation. Investments in research and development, investments in infrastructure, and investments in education like universal pre-K. And we also need to invest in our public colleges and universities to make college more affordable for more families. The more a person learns, the more a person earns. And we need to make it possible for students to actually refinance their college debt and their college loans, just like we made it possible for people to be able to refinance their, their home mortgages. And we should make it the norm. We should make income-based repayment plans the norm so that young people whose passion might be teaching or nursing or policing to be able to follow their dreams and also be able to pay their bills and, and start families. Third, we need to restore accountability to our financial markets. They're important. We want them to work, and we want them to work well. 
but not a single Wall Street executive was convicted of a crime related to the 2008 economic meltdown. Not a single one. <laughs> Explain to me how it is that you can be pulled over for a broken taillight in our country, but if you wreck the world's economy, you're somehow untouchable. I don't get that. We must charge and empower professional regulators to penalize and prosecute those who lie, cheat, and steal with billions and trillions of our dollars at stake. We must reinstate Glass-Steagall to prevent giant banks from gambling with our economy and our money. And if a bank is too big to fail, we need to break it up before it breaks us. Fourth. We need to stop entering into bad trade deals. I'm for trade, and I'm for good trade deals. But I'm against bad trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership that hurt middle class wages, that hurt middle class wages and ship middle class jobs, not to mention making it easier to ship corporate profits overseas. Look, chasing cheap labor abroad will not help us build a stronger economy at home. We need to focus on making our economy sustainable, more circular, and making ourselves strong here at home. That's the best way for us to engage in trade all around the world. And fifth, we must honor those who have worked hard all of their lives and now find themselves approaching a retirement that is anything but secure. We cannot grow our economy if we resign a whole generation of our senior citizens to living their golden years in poverty. So, rather than reducing Social Security or privatizing Social Security, I believe that we need to expand Social Security benefits. In summary, the better choices our national interest demands are not radical, they're not rash, they're not unproven choices. They are the better choices, common sense choices to which many states like Maryland, Colorado, Washington State, Minnesota, and California are returning. In Maryland, we put the primary goal of a stronger middle class at the center of every decision we made. So yes, we raised the minimum wage, we expanded collective bargaining. We passed a living wage while freezing in-state tuition for four years in a row. And we made record investments in education to make our schools the best in the nation, as well as investing more in infrastructure and more in research and more in innovation. These are the choices. These are the investments that made Maryland one of the top states for upward economic mobility for families, that secured Maryland the highest median income in the nation, and also, since the depths of the recession, that gained Maryland a faster rate of job creation than our neighbors in Virginia or Pennsylvania who were mostly trying to cut their way to prosperity. You see, a stronger middle class is not the consequence of economic growth. A stronger middle class is the cause of economic growth. And we know how to do this. We must return, in other words, to our true selves. We must rebuild and restore our economy from the middle out and from the middle up. When workers earn more money, businesses have more customers and need more workers, and our whole economy grows. This is why every choice we make together in our democracy whether it's wage policies or investment policies or regulatory policies, should serve the cause of a stronger and growing and more inclusive middle class. We are Americans, and we make our own destiny. We use our talents, our hard work, our better choices to build a better future together. A jobs agenda for renewable energy that's a match for the climate challenge. A, uh, uh, a new agenda, a national agenda to rebuild America's cities. Investments in infrastructure and innovations and the skills of our people that make our country stronger so we can be able to do more for our children and grandchildren. Free markets 
Free markets by themselves do not create the generational wealth of great nations. Rational, hardworking, caring, and patriotic human beings do. The future we choose for our children and grandchildren as Americans is not a future of less opportunity. It is a future of more. We are standing at the threshold of a new era of American progress. And we need only the will and the leadership to move forward to the future we prefer. Thank you very much, and I look forward to talking with you after. going to open up for questions. I think many of you know the drill. Please identify yourself and your affiliation. One brief question. No speeches. In your question with a question mark. Okay, so we have a mic here, there, there, and there. There's a mic there. Right here. There's a mic right there, sir, if you'd like a question. Yeah, right behind you. A question. This is like Mayor's Night right Out. There. Hi, uh, my name is John. I'm a sophomore at the college. And uh, my question for you is, do you think that a Hillary Clinton presidency would be able to accomplish this uh, economic vision here? <laughs> Well, John, that's a very skillf skillfully constructed question. <laughs> um, the, uh, how can I answer that? Well, <laughs> well that'll, be, that'll, be up to, that'll be up to the American people. The, uh, those of us who may uh, step forward to offer ourselves as candidates, uh, something I'm seriously considering myself, uh, have, a, uh, have a more uh, defined role and that is to put forward our very best in terms of the ideas, the frameworks, and the better choices. And if anyone believes they have the executive experience, the ability to bring people together to get difficult things done, they should offer. And then it'll be up to the people to decide, and we'll be a better country for it. Thank you. Hello, Governor. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jacob Morello. I'm a senior at the college. Um, and you mentioned that one of your proposals would be to expand the Social Security program. So I'm curious, um, you know, as of the latest trustees report, Social Security is, ex is expected to run out of money in 2033. And so expanding it would reduce the life of that by up to a decade, if not more. So um, my guess is that you would probably propose raising taxes in order to pay for this expansion. Um, you know, I'm a senior, I'm about to enter the workforce, as are 1,600 of my friends, so, you know, I'm curious, do you think that that's a good idea, raising taxes on working Americans, considering that about 50% of the federal budget is devoted to seniors, and the federal government spends every year $26,000 on seniors, whereas they only spend $12,000 on children? Yeah, great question. Look, let me, um, wh when I was, uh, during the eight years that I was governor and before that as mayor, uh, uh, the choices that we made, and some of them that I talked about tonight, we paid for all of them. Our state had a AAA bond rating. I mean, every state has to balance its budget. And you probably see a lot of governors coming through and saying, we, unlike the federal government, had to balance our budget every year. Yeah, well, we did too. But we had a AAA bond rating all the way through that. And uh, also made the investments that allowed us to come out of the recession sooner than others. So, so no progress is sustainable if you're not willing to pay for it and be fiscally responsible. I believe that you can, we can pay for this expansion of Social Security, and I believe we must, because once upon a time, everyone was told you had a three-legged stool for retirement, personal savings, employer pensions, and Social Security. Well, now people don't have the savings, and so many employer pensions have been wiped out that most people only have Social Security. So for the sake of our economy and making our economy grow, uh, we can't have this sort of bubble of baby boomers approaching golden years in retirement. The way you pay for it, I think, is three primary ways. One, you raise the uh, earnings cap on payroll taxes uh, uh, so that wealthier people do contribute to Social Security. It's not called senior security, it's called Social Security. It's good for our entire society. Secondly, 
by passing immigration reform and opening up a pathway to 11 million people to live in the full light of society and also to contribute to Social Security, that helps with the sustainability of that program. And then the third thing is that if we go for another 10 years with people learning less than they did last year, that would be a, uh, uh, damaging to our deficit, our debt, and also to Social Security. So these wage policies and the, then all fit together with, um, with the uh, solvency and extending the solvency of Social Security. So those three things, raising the threshold, immigration reform, and wage policies that lift up uh, uh, our middle class, allow us to make more when we work harder. I'll try to be shorter in answer. Can we take a question? Yes, Hi, sir. Governor. My name is Max Liebeskind. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the college. I want to ask you a question about- Where are you from? I'm from New York City. Um, Good place. Um, I, yeah, I guess my governor is probably not running for president. But uh, I, <laughs> I, I want to ask you a question about campaign finance. So you're, you're a lawyer, and as you probably know, there's obviously been a lot of anger about the Citizens United decision. But in fact, the Supreme Court decided long before that that corruption in, in campaign finance can really, really only counts as quid pro quo corruption, which is why they've allowed for quite some time in various forms unli essentially unlimited independent expenditures. So my question for you is, given that the Supreme Court has ruled this, would you support a constitutional amendment um, allowing Congress to place caps on independent expenditures? And perhaps more broadly, do you agree that the only type of corruption is you know, quid pro quo corruption, where I give you a bribe and you give me a policy? Let me, I do support the, uh, I do support the uh, overturning of Citizens United. I, I believe our state passed a, a resolution to that. Uh, I could be wrong, but I do support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. I don't believe that corporations are people. Uh, <laughs> And there's a lot of good ideas that are starting to bubble up from America's cities where you know, we're actually very forward acting and forward leaning mayors. Um, men and women have been able to restore the trust necessary in, in how we govern ourselves. So um, uh, there's also some interesting, uh, so on campaign finance reform, I think we need to look at the ideas that work that actually leverage those smaller donations and multiply them by matching them uh, by some exponent. And I think that would all be a positive move in the right direction. To your larger question about corruption and the definition of corruption, uh, one, of the, one definition of corruption is when special interests are always able to prevail over national interests and our common good. And unfortunately, not unfortunately, uh, the fact of the matter is because of the choices that we have made, to concentrate wealth in the hands of the very few and also to overturn spending limits, especially on independent expenditures and the like, and Citizens United, we've gotten to a situation where the accumulated capital is has accumulated political influence. And you see it time and time again, most notably when uh, I believe the effort I'd start to lose track of the various times that our Congress has attempted to shut down our government. But I do believe when they were debating whether or not to continue to fund our homeland security, I believe that forces from Wall Street uh, at the top of some of the biggest banks and trading companies insisted on slipping in a rider to that reauthorization of homeland security funding that would water down Dodd-Frank. That is a trumping of the national interest for the sake of special interest. And uh, I, in this conversation that we're about to have as a nation, we need to elevate the national interest. We need to heal our democracy, make our government work, reform campaign finance, and, and, and move very quickly to bipartisan congressional redistricting commissions, or we won't have the trust necessary to make a great country. Right here. Um, hello, my name is Marcus Dennis. I'm a freshman at the college and a resident of Fort Washington, Maryland. All right. As well as a good Gonzaga graduate, so All it's right. good to see you out there. Go Eagles. Eagles fly high. You know it. Um, <laughs> 
So just between you and me, right? Between us two. Yes or no, are you going to run for the office of President of the United States? And if you're going to, you made the hard decisions to raise taxes and fees in Maryland 31 times during your eight years as governor. And you talked about a lot about funding your different um, policies. With those policies, you didn't raise taxes just on the highest percentage of uh, those income in Maryland. It was through all citizens. So would you do the same when you are President of the United States, if you run for President of the United States? Or if you were to say yes to my initial question? Okay. The, uh, that's a compound question. To the, first, to the first point, I'll make a decision by the end of May. Okay. I'll make a decision, just between you and me. Look I'll make a decision by the end. Yeah, let me talk a little bit about what we did in Maryland. We were, uh, very briefly, not to get entirely ship in the bottle with you, but you'll find other stuff online. Uh, we did, when we, uh, when I defeated a Republican incumbent governor and stepped into that trust for you and your family, uh, we were facing a $1.7 billion structural deficit, a can that had been kicked down the road and had accumulated. So we had to tackle it. We tackled it early in a special session and none of the choices were individually popular. In fact, they were all individually very unpopular. Uh, the three, four primary choices that we made were these. We put in place uh, a dollar tax on uh, 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 cigarettes, which allowed us to extend health care before the Affordable Care Act to about 300,000 people, mostly children, who didn't have it before in Maryland. The second uh, thing that we did was we uh, raised the corporate income tax by 1%, which still kept us in the middle of our, uh, of our region in terms of competitiveness. The third thing that we did that we did ask everyone to do was to pay another penny on our sales tax, which at the time was five cents with no local kind of you know, piggyback onto it, uh, so, which made us the 42nd lowest sales tax in the nation. And we did ask everybody to pay another penny on that. And with those dollars, we were able to invest in creating the best public school system in America, recognized by Education Week magazine, five years in a row. Those dollars went to equitable school funding. And um, the fourth piece of that fiscal fix was we put in place for the first time in Maryland a progressive income tax. So on that score, we asked the top earning 15% of us to pay more, and everybody else paid the same or less. That's 85% of us and offset the impact of the sales tax on our most humble earning households. We raised the earned income tax credit, the state version, and then we went back and raised it a second time a few years later. So that's what we did. Uh, we just came through a campaign at home where the Republican nominee for, for governor beat my image over the head for the 31 taxes and tolls I, I raised. Uh, some of them were fishing licenses, some of them were bridge tolls that hadn't been raised since 1972. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, in terms of percentage of income, our state has, uh, there are only uh, three states that have a lower state and local tax burden than Maryland as percentage of income. So we focus on prosperity and upward mobility. And we made, you know, one of the things that makes me a little different than some of the governors that you see uh, running around the country nationally, is we've actually done these things in our state. And we succeeded in uh, creating greater upward economic mobility for our people, along with raising procurement goals and minority and women business things and, and other things. So anyway, that's what we did. And, uh, and we were the better for it. But most of those things were singularly unpopular. Right here. Uh, Governor, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm a Harvard alumnus. Um, I think you would agree. I appreciate your talk on the importance of the economy, and a big important aspect of the economy is capable political leadership. And I think back to when uh, in Democratic primaries, Barack Obama ran in a primary, a very contested primary. So did Hillary Clinton and also Joe Biden. And it turned out that some would argue that Joe Biden became a very good vice president. Uh, Hillary Clinton became a great secretary of state. Um, if you look forward to the future, do you think it's possible that Hillary Clinton could be a good vice president? And <laughs> alternatively, do you think you could be a good vice president? Oh, man. I, don't think, I don't think anybody actually runs for vice president. Uh, I don't think anybody runs for vice president. I think, uh, 
I think what we hope, though, is that all of our public officials have the humility to approach these public trusts, uh, understanding that they have a tremendous amount to learn every single day. I mean, if there's something that uh, a great and a very elusive commodity in our country right now, it's, it's understanding. And I would, I would hope that all of our leaders would confess the fact that all of us have a lot to learn and a lot more to understand about ourselves, about one another, about this world that we find ourselves the leaders of at a really perilous time. Rachel Brinkley from Quincy. Where is she? Up in the rafters. There we go. From uh, where? Quincy, Massachusetts. Sure. Just wanted to thank you for your speech. You made many important points on the economy, on the financial problems. Uh, so I, I would like to say, I think on behalf of many people, I, I urge your candidacy on, on this issue. I think it's very important. Thank you. And also, in respect to the physical economy as well, things like the water crisis in California, which mm. I think is a solvable crisis. I think there are many solutions that can be adopted, but I, that simply that, that message. Hey, thank you. Yeah, we didn't talk too much about the environment or sustainability here tonight. If we, if we look at the challenges that we have on this planet of finite resources as an opportunity, I think there are ways that we can, uh, that we can face down this threat and actually uh, be, a, be a truly great generation of Americans. I mean, the things that, the, the technology that we have the ability to bring forward on clean water, on clean energy, on renewable energy, um, and, and boy, the clock is ticking. Uh, as you see the severe weather across the country and you see what we're facing in California, uh, we, uh, we have to usher this era forward, wrap it in a prosperity frame and go after it as the greatest business opportunity we've ever been confronted by. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone, questions. We need questions. Hi, Governor. Thanks for speaking today. My name is Arjun, and I'm a sophomore in the college. Where um, are you from? I'm from Florida. I wanted to ask you a question that's not related to the economy, but to social issues. Um, and I'll keep it brief. Um, I know that you supported um, the equal marriage law in your state. And I wanted to ask, how are you um, able to rec uh, reconcile um, support for same-sex marriage with your religion, or do you see those two not coming into conflict? Yeah, the, great question. Uh, I was recently invited to give a talk, and you can find the full talk online if you're suffering from insomnia. I, <laughs> actually, it's a serious question, and I enjoyed the talk and the time I spent there. Uh, Recently gave a talk to the Society of, of Christian Ethics and was there, they were meeting with Muslim ethicists and, and Jewish ethicists. And uh, look, the way, the touchstone beliefs that I have are things that have been formed in me by the parents and the household where I was raised, by my faith, uh, by the beliefs that we share as Americans. And as I have sorted out my responsibilities and, and have strived to make the best decision and the right decision for the right reasons, I think that there are three main beliefs that I return to all the time. It is a belief in the dignity of every human being, every person. It is a belief in our own responsibility to advance our common good, even as we recognize that we are people, a diverse people of many different faiths. And third, that we understand that that we need each other and that we're all in this together. So as we looked at the issue of marriage equality in Maryland, not only were we able to pass it at the legislature, but then it was petitioned a referendum. So we had to have a much larger conversation in our state. And our argument in es in essentially was this, uh, our closing argument in this conversation. Uh, and it was a touch and go proposition and many people thought that there were too many very religious, traditionally religious people in Maryland to be able to pass this when we did. But this was the argument we made. We said that we should all be free to, to practice our faith as we choose. But all of us can agree as Americans, can't we, that there is dignity in every child's home and that every child's home should be protected equally under the law. And so that's how I've, I've come out on it. That was my thinking. And 
ultimately, that's why the people of Maryland became the first in the country to approve civil marriage equality at the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Governor. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Happy. Hello again. Um, Hello again. Um, so personally, my family came to this country six years ago, and I deeply care about comprehensive immigration reform. So I want to ask uh, for you specifically, what specific action would you take, whether you're on a campaign trail, whether you're elected to be president, or maybe n and in any scenario, what would you do to push for comprehensive immigration reform? Well, I believe that the way we campaign determines how we govern. So whoever the candidates ultimately turn out to be in the presidential contest in our party, we need to elevate immigration reform as an economic imperative for our country. This should not be about satisfying this group or placating that group. Or it needs to be about us together. It needs to be about our national interests, we the people, our economy, our innovation, consumer demand would be best served by passing comprehensive immigration reform that specifically would involve a path to citizenship for the 11 million people who are here working hard, love this country, and can make us stronger if they live in the full light of our society. Having that conversation nationally then gives uh, the, uh, uh, would then give the next president of the United States the ability to act on that mandate uh, and, and to never ever give up on it. Look. Uh, it may appear to us sometimes that this is the most polarized, divisive, gridlock time in our country's history. We've actually had worse, and we've gotten through those. We'll get through this, but only with national leadership that calls us back to our principles and to our values and puts the best interests of our country first. That's what we need to do with this, and we need not give up. Because I've been all over the country, and I'll tell you, I don't find a whole lot of people under 40 that deny climate change or hate immigrants. That's where our country's headed. Our country is headed to a more inclusive, a more generous, and a more connected space. And we need to speak to it and govern to it. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hi, Governor O'Malley. Uh, my name is Matt Hellauer. I'm a first year in the joint degree MBA MPP here at Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School, and born and raised in Ellicott City, Maryland. So. Thank you. I see an Orioles jersey, too. You're yeah. the third person I've met tonight from Ellicott City, Maryland. Very nice. Are you all having a convention? <laughs> yeah, is a, this is it. So thank you for the service to our, our state. Thank you. Uh, being here in, in, uh, in Boston this past year, I can't help but compare and contrast Boston to our hometown of Baltimore. And they have a lot of similar resources. They have an amazing waterfront, some of the best universities in the world, the best hospitals <coughs> in the country but I feel like the cities are on a divergent paths. Boston's thriving, but potentially Baltimore has been stricken with crime the past uh, few decades and has had population decline since the 1960s. And I'm just wondering, as someone who cares deeply about the city and wants to return, how do we fix this? Tell me your name again, was it Matt? Matt, Matt Hellauer. Matt, the last time I was here at the Kennedy School was about 13 years ago. I was here with a man named uh, Jack Maple, I guess it was 14 years ago then. And Jack had been the deputy police commissioner for the NYPD. Uh, I share that with you because uh, for all of the shows, The Corner of the Wire, Homicide, that have talked about how violent Baltimore became. And hey, we did allow ourselves to become really violent. In fact, we allowed ourselves to become the most violent, the most addicted, and the most abandoned city in America in terms of population loss. More population loss actually than Detroit in the 30 years leading up to 1999. Uh, that was our past and that was our reality. But when we started doing the things that worked, a better job of policing, a better job of policing the police, expanding drug treatment, intervening earlier in the lives of young people at risk, we achieved in Baltimore the biggest reduction over those next 10 years of part one crime of any major city in America. And just about a month ago in the Baltimore Sun, there was an article that said that not only is Baltimore's population growing again, but the Baltimore has seen a bigger increase in uh, 18 to 25 year olds choosing to live in the city again than all but about three or four other cities. So uh, we are headed in a much better direction as a city. We still need some greater investments in mass transit. 
That's true. We uh, still need more affordable housing. We can be the solution in our state to our smart growth and sustainable growth challenges as we continue to make our city safer. Uh, one, thing th uh, and, uh, one thing that Massachusetts and that the Boston area has, uh, and it's incredibly, uh, not incredibly, a, 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 a brilliantly uh, successful commonwealth and state, and uh, the life science and the biotech industry are not dissimilar from what we have going on in Maryland. In fact, over the last eight years, if any of my staff would say to me on the good rankings that come out, schools or innovation or those sorts of things, that we came in second, I always knew that Massachusetts was the one that came in first. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's cool. I mean, we like to have good, com good friendly competitors in building this new economy. Uh, but the... Um, uh, uh, Wanted the co-location of so many top-notch business schools in the Boston area with your researchers is a great ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, we're no slackers on that. I mean, in fact, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which hardly ever says nice things about Democratic governors, named us the number one state for innovation and entrepreneurship three years in a row. But Baltimore's area has traditionally lacked great business schools. We have one now, recently started uh, the uh, Cary School of Business at Johns Hopkins that I believe has the potential to grow into a great business school. Uh, full disclosure, I am a visiting professor there. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hi, um, thank you for speaking with us. My name is Daniel Tostado. I'm an MPP student here uh, from San Diego, if you're curious. Thank you, um, great weather there. Yeah, <laughs> like today. Um, so you spoke of a lot of common sense, uh, progressive, progressive fiscal policies, raising the minimum wage, having universal pre-K, um, raising social security benefits. My question revolves around the fact that I think that that would necessarily increase government spending. Um, if you were to run for president, would you campaign on reducing or eliminating the deficit spending that occurs? Yes, but that I don't, I, well, yes I would. But I think what the biggest deficits we suffer from right now are actually divestments in our own country that only we can make. I mean, um, in the 70s, four, we invested to the tune of about 4% of GDP into you know, the non-defense discretionary spending, namely transportation, education, research and development. That 4% is now headed to about 1.5%. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge we face is a, a, an economy that lacks <laughs> consumer demand, wages that are declining, and public investments that have not kept pace with the demands of a 21st century technological economy. So uh, on some of these things, we're going to have to do more, not less. Uh, and that's and that's the fact of that's the fact of the matter. Uh, but as our economy grows, that also allows us to bring our deficit and our debt down. In fact, I mean, no president has has achieved uh, smaller levels of average annual spending increases than President Obama over these last seven years. Uh, but um, part of that has been achieved at the expense of an economy that could be growing faster and a country that could be doing more, especially with its people who are underemployed and underskilled for the opportunities that we're creating now. Uh, you gotta do both, man. It's all about balance. You have to be fiscally disciplined. You have to be able to balance budgets, but you also have to be smart enough to know that India and China are not going to make these investments for us. Only we can do this, and, uh, and we have the ability as a people to do it. And it can be done in a fair and progressive way. Thanks. I'm gonna go right up here. Thank you so much, Governor. Uh, I'm Lily Valona, um, uh, first year here at the college, and my question's a little off the beaten path. Uh, excuse me, off the beaten path, but I think uh, it's worthwhile to expand the typical um, political discourse that we usually engage in. Um, They're on the edge of their seats. <laughs> that's not. It's not that exciting. <laughs> um, so you talked in your speech uh, about you know, economic, ba basically ways to level the playing field for those who have been excluded um, in one way or another by our economic structure. 
So to I'm include, to include more people more fully. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm wondering if, uh, in the tradition of um, of economic reparations for those Japanese Americans who uh, who were uh, unable to work and earn money um, while they were in internment camps uh, during World War II, um, and so that those economic reparations were paid out um, an average of twenty thousand dollars. Would you support? Um, and you can say, you can explain theoretically or um, in actuality, would you support um, reparations for those Americans whose families were enslaved and thus were not able to keep the, you know, the fruits of their labor essentially, and then whose work did go to build our nation, um, but were economically excluded and, yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe I, I would support that, Lily, but what I do support is building up a, a stronger country for everyone. What I do support is building an economy with a human purpose that allows everyone to be included regardless of where they're born and what zip co code they were born into. And, and so I support those things. And I think the way that we, the, we honor the, uh, the suffering and, uh, and the pain and the death of so many people whose hard work built this country is to make our country stronger and better, more generous, more compassionate, more appreciative and understanding of, of one another. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back here. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Mr. O'Malley? Yes, sir. I'm Christian Newis. I mean, remember, I wrote you a letter, an email to ask, supporting you and asked you to, to run for president, of, for president of the United States. You say you'll make... You say that you'll make that decision at the end at the end of May. Yes, sir. You'll make that decision at the end of May. Yes, sir. By the end of May. Yeah. Good luck. I support you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And Chris Mules. <laughs> by, by the, by the, by the way, I've been to Maryland. I visited and I visited Annapolis. I visited the State House. Did you like it? I did. Very nice. Very beautiful. Thank you. George Washington liked it too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Thank you very very much. Yes. Oh, oh, sure. Yes. All right. Thank you. Go right here. Hello, Governor. Oh, is it on? Hello. Oh, hello, Governor. My name is Dan. I'm from uh, Central New Jersey. Um, and my question is: since we've you've talked a lot about building a better economy for the middle class, and you're a former mayor and a former governor, how would you approach foreign policy issue matters of foreign policy from that background? Thank you. Great question. The, uh, look, I believe that America has an indispensable role to play in this world of ours. And I believe that we do that best, not only for the world, but for our, our posterity, when we engage with our neighbors around the world uh, consistent with our best principles and our best values. We do that in two ways. I believe that we do that by making ourselves stronger at home because the rest of the world looks at what we do rather than what we say. And that's why this cause of creating greater opportunity and building up our middle class is so very important to our credibility around the world. And this system that we believe in of, of government and respect for individual rights. The second way that we do this is, I, I think that is we have to move out of the old story of the United States, uh, uh, the, the old story where the world was, uh, uh, world politics and, and foreign uh, policy was determined by giant superpowers. And as a superpower, we need to engage in a new age of collaboration with like-minded people around the world for the, against the common threats to our humanity. What does that mean? What am I talking about? I mean that we need to become much more far-seeing. We have to recognize that change is happening more rapidly in this world, especially with failed nation states and asymmetrical warfare and the like. And we have to be able to be engaged in looking over that horizon, developing relationships with new and emerging leaders in the next generations of, of countries that may appear to be a threat to us today, but have populations, the majority of which are under 30 today as well and whose opinions and uh, our relationships with them can be forged and changed if we deploy not just our military power, which is considerable, 
but understand that from the power of our principles, we also have the ability to deploy our economic power, our diplomatic power, and yes, our considerable healing power that makes us respected in this world and allows us to anticipate change so that it benefits us here at home rather than threatening our children's security. So uh, as I approach, uh, that's how I approach it. I've led trade delegations all around, you know, to, to places all over the world. I've met with heads of, of state and other countries. I've found, as uh, John Kennedy himself said, that the, the reassuring fact that human nature is the same the world over. And uh, I've also spent a lot of time working on uh, homeland security and preparedness here at home. So uh, one of the keys that you develop as an executive, whether it's mayor or as governor, is also a very, very important skill for commander of chief and in chief, whose job is to keep us all safe. And that is the ability to interpret and take in a lot of different information and be able to make the best decision at the time. Because a lot of times, the failure to make a decision only makes the problem worse. And I think most people that have been mayors or governors understand that. Thank you. OK. Last question. Uh, no pressure. Hi, Governor. Uh, yesterday, hundreds of thousands of workers and Democratic primary voters marched across America to support a $15 minimum wage. Uh, no candidate has supported a numerical target. Would you come out in favor of the $15 minimum wage? If not, what specifically would be your numerical target for the minimum wage? What would the policy be? Yeah, I support a $15 minimum wage. <laughs> and, and I believe what you're seeing happening is that metropolitan areas like Seattle or in our own state, I mean, we raised our state minimum wage to 1010 that was the furthest I could push it and still get the consensus to get it done. But Montgomery County raised theirs to, I think, 1280. Prince George's, where's my friend from Fort Washington? Prince George's raised theirs to 1280 as well. 80% uh, of our GDP growth comes from metro economies. And you're going to see, I predict, in the years ahead, more and more metro areas raising their minimum wage. And rather than that hurting their economy, it's going to fuel economic growth greater consumer demand, and make their cities and their metro areas stronger economies. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's a microcosm of what we need to do. And uh, once they show that it's successful, it'll be uh, easier to return to what Democrats and Republicans always did not so very long ago, which was to make sure that the minimum wage always stays above the poverty line so that nobody who works hard has to raise their kids in poverty. Thanks for the last question. Thanks. their higher earnings. And this inclusiveness, the robust participation of more and more of our people, is the heart and cause of sustained long-term generational prosperity in the United States of America. The American economy, the American economy that our parents and grandparents lived and built from their choices was an extraordinary success. I'd like to talk about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. In the economy that our parents and grandparents built, in sharp contrast to what's happened across various income levels over the last 30 or 40 years, in sharp contrast to that, from 1947 to 1979, every income group of households in the United States from the poorest to the richest, were able to increase their earnings by at least 100% in real inflation-adjusted dollars over that 40-year period of time. All of that progress was built on hard work, 
expanding economic participation, and policy choices that made sure that wages actually kept up with increased productivity. Of course, all of that started to change when we started making different choices. Beginning in 1980, we turned away from this tried and true success story, and we embraced a different theory, a new theory, a new story, a story that turned out to be false. Now, whether we call that story supply-side economics, as President Reagan, its pioneer, liked to call it, or whether we call it voodoo economics, as President George H.W. Bush referred to it, or whether we call it trickle-down economics, widening circles of our people. This is both the moral theory of our nation and it is the economic theory of our nation. It is this inclusive theory of growth put into practice that has made and built the largest, strongest, and most prosperous middle class that the world had ever known. It is the national story of success that has made us known the world over as the land of opportunity. There is no such thing in our country as a spare American. And I would submit to you that impulse, that impulse that we share as Americans to treat everyone with dignity and respect is the same impulse that is actually best for economic growth of the sort that lifts us all. You see, the economy isn't money. The economy is people. It is the work, the imagination, the grit, the desire, the skill, the love of family, the creative capacity of every person that actually drives our economy and makes our country stronger. This is why signs that once read, no Irish need apply, or no women, or no blacks, or no Jews, have become sad relics of our past. This is why the next generation of Americans so universally rejects state laws that discriminate against gay and lesbian. Americans. The fact of our world is this. Democratic nations are more prosperous nations, and it's not merely a coincidence. People in democratic nations have the opportunity to participate more, to innovate more, to take more risks and start companies, and yes, to drive economic demand, consumer demand. Asking him, as I watched him, sweat and put out a tremendous amount of effort, hoisting kegs, bussing, moving things all over the place. I said, Miguel, how is it that you can work so hard? And rather than answering my question, how, he answered me very plainly, why? In just one phrase. And he said, for my daughter. Our national character is defined by a very powerful idea. The idea that the United States of America offers economic opportunity for all. And as Americans, we believe that no matter who you are or where you were born, your hard work should pay off. We believe as Americans that every individual willing to work hard should also be able to get ahead that every American should be able to provide, in other words, for a better quality of life for their children and for their grandchildren. And this is the powerful truth of the American dream that we share. It is the core of our national character. It is the story that has guided our economic choices as a people for most of these 240 years. And these are the choices that built the strongest and most resilient economy the world has ever known. We, the people, have chosen generation after generation to give our children a future with more opportunity, not less. And together, we've strived in every generation 
to include more of our citizens more fully in the economic, in the political, and in the social life of our republic. In other words, to extend and to make true the American dream to ever wide the United States. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll risk a prediction that he gets a question on that tonight. <laughs> Finally, we hear that the governor is said to be an accomplished singer and guitarist. Speaking for many, I have to say, we're a little disappointed he doesn't have his guitar with him tonight. Nonetheless, we are entirely pleased and honored to welcome Governor Martin O'Malley to the floor. Maggie, thank you very, very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you. Uh, the weather's very nice as well. I want to thank you for turning that out a little better than the four feet of snow you endured this year, huh? You deserve a good spring. So, uh, look, it's wonderful to be with you, and I want to thank you, Maggie, for your kind introduction and for your hospitality, and also uh, I want to thank you for your kind review of my musical abilities. Uh, I offer the disclaimer that, uh, just like in government, I tried to surround myself th with really good people. And, uh, but I've been asked to come here tonight to talk with you, all of you about building an economy that works for everyone and about the better choices that we need to make together if we're going to make that true. Um, as Maggie alluded to, uh, all through college and law school, I had a band. So I spent uh, log quite a few hours working, and I put that in quotes, uh, but in restaurants and other establishments. And uh, true story, in one of these restaurants, uh, I noticed this man who, through his hard work, managed to keep the whole business going. He was the guy who was there early. He was there late at the end of the night. He was an immigrant. His name was Miguel. And I remember very late one night after everybody had gone home. Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard, and tonight I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing one of America's most dynamic political leaders, Governor Martin O'Malley. Earlier this year, Martin O'Malley completed his second term as governor of Maryland, ending, at least temporarily, a 27-year career of public service. In 1988, the governor became an assistant state's attorney for the city of Baltimore. In 1990, he was elected to the Baltimore City Council. In 1998, he was elected Baltimore's mayor, and he won Maryland's governorship in 2006. Back in 2002, Esquire magazine named Governor O'Malley best young mayor in the country. Three years later, Time named him one of the top five big city mayors while Business Week called him one of the five new stars in the Democratic Party. As Maryland governor, Mr. O'Malley signed a bill that made children of undocumented immigrants eligible for in-state college tuition. <laughs> and he signed legislation legalizing same-sex marriage. Both bills were upheld in voter referendums. A longtime opponent of capital punishment, Governor O'Malley signed a bill repealing the death penalty in Maryland for future offenders. He also chaired the Democratic Governors Association from 2011 to 2013. But let's talk about now. <laughs> the governor is mentioned in the media, discussed in political circles, and has ignited the interest of many Americans as a possible candidate for president